Together, Father, we praise you. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise your son. He is the lamb that was slain so that we might be forgiven and freed. Thank you, Lord God, for the glory of Jesus Christ, for the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the scriptures that you have given us so that we might understand this. And I ask, Lord, that your spirit would open our eyes and give us sight to be able to understand what your word would have for us to consider today. Be our guide and our helper. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, friends, I'm opening up my Bible to John chapter 18 and verse 38. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one close to the seat back in front of you. You can pick it up and turn it to John chapter 18. John's in the New Testament. There's a table of contents at the front if you don't know where to go. It'd be really easy if things fit into nice and neat categories, wouldn't it? It'd be really easy if things fit into nice and neat categories, but sometimes they don't as much. I remember when I was in university as a late teen and I was at a Christian school and the school was really pushing like, marriage is good, so you know, you should date someone. And like everyone was trying to date everyone and it didn't work out a lot. And I remember hearing conversations frequently on campus where a guy would say to another guy, hey, did you have a DTR with that girl? And some of you were just like, what the heck is this debauchery DTR? So DTR is what one person might say if you are, don't know if you're a friend or more than a friend and you just, we need to determine this relationship. <laughs> what category do we fit in? Like, are we just friends? Are we more than friends? You know, sometimes things don't fit into nice and easy categories in relationships, also in just like basic stuff. For instance, you can answer this question out loud if you want. Is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? Okay, most people said it wrong. The answer, in the States at least, is yes. I'm not joking, the Supreme Court actually decided this in the States. <laughs> you think the Supreme Court talks about important stuff in the States? Mm. In 1883, the US government put a tax on all vegetable imports, a tariff on vegetables coming into the country, and the New York State Port Authority started taxing vegetable, uh, excuse me, tomatoes, and one producer, uh, company John Nix and Co. sued the government. He's like, yo, these are fruits. You can't tax my tomatoes. They're fruits, not vegetables. Technically, it is a fruit, right? Scientifically, uh, the fruit is the part of the plant that carries the seeds of that plant. There are seeds in tomatoes, therefore, a tomato is a fruit. Vegetables are just like any part of the plant. Like, we eat roots of plants and stuff. That's vegetables. But the this uh, court lawsuit went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court unanimously decided in 1897, I think it was, that, well, in the normal vernacular of the day, most people think that they're actually vegetables because we eat fruits, like strawberries and peaches, at the end of the meal. But we eat vegetables, you know, like potatoes, and in the middle, at the main course of the meal. And we eat tomatoes at the main course, so they're unanimously decided they're vegetables. Some things don't fit into nice and easy categories. And our culture really struggles to put Jesus into a certain category. You know, our culture hears that people worship Jesus and that he's God, and mm, that's a little too much for some people, but they like that what he teaches. So some people like to fit Jesus into this category of, well, he, maybe he's like this just like good moral teacher a spiritual guru, you know, like Confucius or Gandhi or Buddha, you know, he's just this guy to help me on my spiritual journey towards happiness. But did Jesus even give us that opportunity to consider him in that category? This Easter season, we're looking at the life of Jesus and the story of the cross through the eyes of a skeptic, the man named Pontius Pilate, who was the man who actually sentenced Jesus to death. And last time we were in the narrative, we saw that Pilate heard Jesus' claim of being a king, and Pilate quickly dismissed Jesus. Like, mm. Today, we're going to see that Pilate starts to be very conflicted about what Jesus' true identity is, and he doesn't know what category to fit him in. So in our culture... We're unsure who Jesus is, but our goal today from Jesus' own claims about himself is to ask and answer this question, is Jesus just a good teacher or 
is he something more? So John chapter 18, I'm gonna read actually from verse 37 to verse 40 at first. We're gonna just go through this story from 1837 to 19 verse 11. We wanna understand what the story is and then see if we can discern an answer from that story. And then if once we've gained that answer, we wanna get grasp the meaning. What does it mean for us? If we actually put this into practice, what difference would it make? So John chapter 18, verse 37. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this person, purpose I was born, and for this purpose I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So, do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Last week, when we looked at the life of Pilate, we saw that his attitudes towards Jesus was just like, is he really a threat? You know, they claimed that he was a a rebel king, and maybe, was was he really a threat to Roman authority? Pilate dismissed that. The attitude that Pilate has towards Jesus today in the passage is, can I just make this go away? Pilate already said he's innocent, but for some reason he doesn't let him go. If if he had any moral fiber in him, he would have just let an innocent man go. But maybe he retained jurisdiction over Jesus because he wanted to use political leverage over the Jews to like appease them and give them a little bit of what they wanted so that maybe he could get a favor from them later. We don't know exactly why, but he didn't let Jesus go, yet he attempts a series of three compromises to try and appease the Jews, but really the Jews just want Jesus dead. The first compromise actually isn't in John 18, it's in the Gospel of Luke. The first compromise was Pilate sending Jesus to another politician. See, Pilate is a a representative for the Roman government in the region of Judea, but Pilate finds out that Jesus actually isn't from Judea, he's from another region called Galilee. And Pilate knows he doesn't have jurisdiction over the Galilean region, Herod does. So Pilate says, all right, let's send Jesus to Herod and, and he can deal with this. So Jesus goes to Herod and Herod tries to do this trial and discern if he's really guilty. And Jesus doesn't, he pleads the fifth the whole time, doesn't say a word. So Herod, frustrated, sends him back to Pilate. And so Pilate has uh, another attempt at compromise. And this attempt at compromise is what we just read. It's an attempt at a substitution. He wants to create a scenario that is so ridiculous that obviously the Jews are gonna let Jesus go. So he takes two people, one who is clearly innocent, Jesus, and one who is clearly guilty, a man who is called a robber and held in prison named Barabbas. And he thinks to himself, you know, this is so obvious. Obviously they're gonna want to see the guilty man genuinely get his just desserts, but that doesn't work. The Jews just want Jesus dead. So they ask for the release of a truly guilty criminal. So Pilate has a third attempt. And this attempt to appease the Jews is just a lighter punishment. They want him dead, but if I just give him a lighter punishment, then I can let him go. So let's read this verse, chapter 19, verse one. It says, then Jesus took Jesus and flogged him. And the Pilate's twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, hail, king of the Jews. They're mocking him and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said, see, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. It's getting pretty obvious that Pilate's getting really frustrated, isn't he? He's getting frustrated, he's getting uneasy, and it doesn't help that his wife actually tries and gets involved. That's not recorded in John's gospel, but in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 27, 19, Pilate's wife gets involved. 
It says in Matthew 27, 19, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with this righteous man for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Apparently Pilate's wife had this like intuition, like this is wrong, you need to stop. This moment is, is captured in a picture painted by artist Antonio Cesare. It's on the screen. This picture is called Ecce Homo, and that's Latin for behold the man. I really enjoy art history, and especially art that um, it has a sense of realism to it. And when I first saw this picture, the first thing that strikes me is the, there's a people in the crowds on the far balk, uh, roofs, there's people on the ground in the middle, and then there's the people in the balcony. There's three levels of people. And the first level of people closest to us, you see Pilate in the middle, behold the man, and Jesus is just standing there. But notice also that in the picture you see on this balcony, there's only one person whose face you can actually fully see. Everyone's face is turned towards Jesus except for one person, that woman to the right of Pilate who's facing towards us. Everyone's looking at Jesus, but she's looking away from Jesus with this face of disapproval. That's likely the artist's attempt to capture Pilate's wife, who's disapproving of this. But notice also the people in the far back, up on the rooftop with their hands raised in the air. These are likely the Jews who are just yelling out, crucify him. They just want him dead. And they see that Pilate's trying to make some compromise, but nothing is appeasing them. They just want him dead. So they change their game plan. At first, their charge against Jesus was that he committed a political crime. He's a rebel king. You need to stomp him out. But then they change and adjust it to a spiritual crime. Look at verse 7 with me, chapter 19, verse 7. It says, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? When the Jews say that Jesus is the son of God, according to their Jewish frame of mind, they're upset and angry, vindictively angry, because they believe that Jesus is making himself equal with Yahweh, the same God who met Moses on Mount Sinai and gave Israel the law. And that's what Jesus was saying, that he is the son of God, that he is fully divine. But uh, Pontius Pilate was not a Jewish thinker. He was a Roman. And Pilate wouldn't have heard the term son of God and thought it in the same way that the Jews thought of it. He would have thought about it in the way that the Greeks thought about gods. The Greeks and the Romans weren't monotheistic. They were uh, polytheistic. They believed in multiple gods. And in Greek mythology, it wasn't uncommon for uh, gods like Zeus and Apollos, you know, these mythical uh, figures, they would, it's not uncommon that these figures would come in mythical tales into humanity, walk among humanity, and maybe even have relations with human women. And the product of those births would be what we would call demigods, right? Hercules. Hercules was a demigod. So when Pilate hears this frame of thinking a son of God, he gets spooked because he's thinking, oh my goodness, when he asks, where are you from? He knows where Jesus is from. He's from Galilee. He's not asking, where are you geographically from? He's asking, is this guy actually from a spiritual realm? And if so, did I just torture a demigod? Boy is shaking in his boots. And he wants Jesus to answer, but Jesus won't answer. The Jews call him a fraud. Pilate's wife calls him a righteous man. Pilate himself is conflicted, but Jesus knows exactly who he is. And he responds in verse 11, and this statement answers the question of who Jesus really is. Verse 11, Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all 
unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. With this simple remark, the beaten and bruised defendant positions himself as the superior authority over Pilate and over all others with the right himself to judge Pilate and all others. The defendant unveils his true nature that he is actually judge. By his own claims, Jesus doesn't fit into this category that our culture tries to fit him in. They, our culture really doesn't think they need him as a savior. They don't like that he calls himself a God, but they kind of want to just have him as their spiritual guru. But by his own claims, Jesus does not fit into the categories which we have put him in. Jesus, by his own claims, does not allow room for him to be a spiritual guru on your own quest for personal happiness like Buddha or Confucius or Gandhi. According to his own claims and the claims of those who listened to his teaching, Jesus considered himself to be the son of God. And this passage proves that he's more than just a moral teacher, but that he is judge over all. Is Jesus just a good moral teacher? No. Jesus is judge over all. But the good news, the good news, church, is that since Jesus is fit to be judge over all, he alone is fit to be savior for any. Now, I need to pause the sermon for a minute and kind of just address something that's in our cultural frame of thinking. Because whenever we talk about this idea of Whenever the idea of judgment comes up in the context of religion, people start to get a little cringy, right? The word judge doesn't have a good connotation in our public. When people think about being judged in our context, they think about, you know, mean-spirited bullies who think they're morally superior to me and, and who just wag their finger at me and act like they're better than me because they have some moral code that I don't have. Maybe someone has done that to you. Frankly, maybe, maybe you've done that to someone. When I say that Jesus is judge over all, the judgment of Jesus Christ isn't like a mean-spirited bully who wags his finger at you. The judgment of Christ is more like a precise doctor who is able to judge a healthy body and a sick body and then prescribe a path to healing. Bad, vindictive, mean-spirited judgment just says that you're in a bad spot and then leaves you there to suffer. Judgment is good if it's able to show the wrong and prescribe a path to healing. That's what Jesus did when he lived on this earth. There were a lot of mean-spirited, judgmental bullies around Jesus' time. A lot of these people were from this uh, little sect that called themselves the Pharisees. And, And there were some people around that time who had shameful lifestyle choices that people like the Pharisees would just judge in a mean-spirited way. People like prostitutes who they would just ostracize and have nothing to do with them. Jesus, though, Jesus welcomed prostitutes. He didn't dismiss their sin, but he showed them grace. He didn't dismiss their sin. He showed them their sin, gave them his grace, and pointed them to live a better way in which they could have freedom and hope. There were other people in Jesus' age that Pharisees also uh, ostracized and rejected and judged. These would be people that we would consider like white collar criminals. They were in Jesus' age called tax collectors. These people who are authorized by the government to take tax from people, but everyone knew that they were skimming a little extra off the top for themselves. And everyone hated them and pushed them to the side, but Jesus welcomed them. And there's this one tax collector named Zacchaeus. When Jesus welcomed him and showed him his love, the love of Jesus to welcome him, not dismissing his sin, but showing him love, motivated this man, Zacchaeus, to repay 
everything he stole and then to give from the wealth that he earned legally to give his wealth to the poor. And he could only do that because Jesus judged his sin. See, the word judge doesn't need to be a cringy word. The good news is that because Jesus is fit to be judge over all, he alone is able to be savior for any, to provide them freedom and forgiveness, hope and healing, love and mercy. And you may be burdened down by your own sin today. You may be burdened down by your own shame today. You may be worried that if you come to God today that you're gonna get judged. You may be burdened down with sin and shame because you know that you've abused and hurt other people. Because you know that you've not properly cared for your family. Because you know that you've been burdened down in substance abuse. Or maybe because you've been abused by others. Or maybe because you, because you keep going back to that same sin that you just feel like you can't say no to. Friend, Jesus sees your sin but you don't need to fear coming him to him. No more, no more trying to clean myself up before I go to God. No more comparing myself to others and thinking that I'm better than them so I can numb the pain that I actually have. Just allowing God to judge me because he's the only way that I can find freedom. All have sinned. Christ sees our sin. But the good news is that because Jesus is fit to be our judge, he is also fit to be our savior. And this passage, the simple remark of Christ, shows us three traits about Jesus as our judge. And if we will embrace and believe that Jesus is our judge, in these three ways, we will find freedom and forgiveness, hope and healing, love and mercy. So here's the first trait of Jesus that allows us to find these things. First, Jesus judges supremely, so turn to him. Jesus judges supremely, so turn to him. In your notes, it might say turn from him. That's my fault, editing error. It's turn to him. When I mean that Jesus judges supremely, I mean that the way that Jesus judges our choices and our actions, the way that Jesus judges our choices and our actions outrank, outranks anyone else's perception of our choices and actions, and his judgment must be heeded above all other judgments. Look at verse 11 with me, and we'll understand how this is the case. Verse 11, Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. How does this describe that Jesus is supreme judge? Well, Jesus is saying that Pilate, the authority that he has to be able to be a judge isn't derived from he himself. Pilate's authority to be a judge isn't from himself. It's not even ultimately from Emperor Tiberius of Rome who commissioned him to be the prefect in Judea. The authority that Pilate has to judge is ultimately sourced from another place, the place that Jesus says is from above. Well, where, where's that? What is that? What place is that? We get a hint of what this place is in Jesus' conversation with a man named Nicodemus in John chapter three. Cool thing is that Jesus was a, excuse me, Nicodemus was a Pharisee and Jesus also welcomed Pharisees. Jesus not only loves the people that the judgmental people judge, but Jesus also loves the people that judge. That's really reassuring to me because for a long time I was a really judgmental person. But so Jesus has this conversation in John chapter three with a Pharisee and it gives us a clue of what it means that of the authority from above. John chapter three, verse 12 says, if I had told you earthly things and you did not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has, this is the key, look at the directions, ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. Jesus is talking about himself where he came from and where he is able to go. And if you descend from somewhere, where is that place? It's above. The authority that Pilate has is from above, from where Jesus is. The authority that Pilate has is ultimately from the authority that Christ has. 
In this simple remark, the beaten and bruised defendant positions himself as the supreme authority over all others with the right to judge all others. And you know what? I would want to know if Jesus is actually supreme in his judgment and we actually need to heed his judgment, I would really want to know by what standard does he judge? In John chapter 3, we actually get a clue. John chapter 3 says this, this next passage. And this is the judgment. By which way does Jesus judge us? This way. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it might be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. When Jesus is talking about the light, he's talking about himself. You know, kind of in the same way that authors have pseudonyms where they have a real name, but when they author a book, they use a different name. Jesus' pseudonym maybe would be the light. What he's saying is that the judgment that describes whether or not we are walking in evil or walking in good is how we respond to him. The judgment that decides whether or not you are in evil or in good is how are you responding to the teaching of Jesus? How are you responding to the life of Jesus? It's the same for me. So some of you may have lived your entire lives in the darkness, or you may be Jesus is nice, that he's a good teacher, but you've never acknowledged him as God. Some of you are walking in the light and and you're not afraid of of what might be exposed because because you know that Jesus has forgiven you. Many of us, I think, kind of go back and forth. We paint ourselves up so that when we come to church on Sunday, we look like we're in the light and we look like we're uh, embracing Jesus, but the rest of the week, man, if my small group leader saw the way that I worked, maybe they'd, they'd see, he looks like he's in darkness just like all of his coworkers. She looks like she's in darkness just like all of her classmates. Have you turned to the light or are you walking in the darkness? Are you looking into the light and thinking you're in the light but still hiding in the darkness. Are you fooling everyone? Are you fooling everyone by living in such a way that when they see you at church, it looks like you're in the light, but when they go go back and home, it's very clear that you're in the darkness. It's a risk to turn to Jesus. It's a risk to turn to Jesus because you know that if you actually turn to Jesus, that the things that you know that are shameful and guilty would be exposed. It's a risk because if the things that you know are wrong or exposed, you know that, that what would, what would my friends think? What would my family think? And it's a risk because if you turn to the light, you are worried that you might be open up to shame and ridicule. And that might be most frightening. That might be why you stay in the light on Sunday and stay in the darkness the rest of the week because you just want to please whoever's around you. Because you care more about what others think than what God thinks. And you're afraid of who you actually are actually being exposed. Why would I want God to see who I really am? Why would I want others to see who I really am if I can't even look in the mirror and I don't even like who I really am? Friend, God has promised something differently. You do not need to cower in fear and worry. It is a risk, but the reward for stepping into the light is greater than you could ever imagine. This is what God has promised, friend. If you thought that way, then you need to cling to this promise. 1 John 1 verse 8 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Step into the light and the eyes of God that look on you will not be eyes that look on you with mean-spirited judgments, but they will be eyes that look on you with love. Don't cower in terror of the light. Cower in terror of the darkness in your heart that keeps you from turning to the light. Because Jesus is fit to be our judge, 
He is also fit to be our savior. And if you turn to him, if you step into the light, you will find freedom and forgiveness, hope and healing, love and mercy. Jesus is not only the one who judges supremely. Here's the second trait about Jesus' judgment. Jesus judges justly. Jesus judges justly, so be humble before him. When I mean justly, I mean fair and impartial. Whether it's my first day in church or my 50th year in church, God looks at us the same. Whether I am a uh, teacher's pet mama's boy or I am a substance abuser, God looks at us the same. That's a relief. Verse 11 shows us the just judgment of God. The second part of it says this. Look at it together with me. It says, therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. How does this show the justness, the justice of God? Jesus says, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Here, Jesus is likely talking about the Jewish leader named Caiaphas who handed Jesus over to Pilate and Pilate. Jesus is saying that both these men, Caiaphas and Pilate, are guilty. They're both guilty for punishing Jesus, who's an innocent man, but Jesus is saying that one of them, Caiaphas, is uh, deserving of more guilt than Pilate. Jesus fairly and impartially weighs our actions and says that Caiaphas is more guilty than Pilate. Why is that? Because our just and fair God not only judges our actions and our choices, but also the intent of our heart. And in this instance, Pilate doesn't have any malicious intent. He's guilty for punishing an innocent man, but Caiaphas does have malicious intent. Pilate is en- or excuse me, Caiaphas is envious. Caiaphas wants Jesus dead. He has murderous intent. And because the intent of the heart is malicious, Jesus fairly and partially says that Caiaphas has the greater sin. In Jesus' sermon that we call the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the ethics of living in his kingdom. And he regularly specifies that sin isn't just sin when it's acted upon. You might not have never known this before. In the eyes of God, sin isn't just sin when it's acted upon. Sin is sin when it's birthed in the intent of our heart. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that Adultery isn't adultery when you sleep with someone's spouse. Adultery is adultery when you lust after someone who isn't your spouse in your heart. Jesus says in the same sermon that murder isn't just murder when you take someone's life. In the eyes of God, murder is murder when you have murderous anger towards someone in your heart. You know, recently I I deleted social media off my phones. I'll probably have it back on in a week or something. I just needed a break. But whenever I scroll through social media and whatever you do too, generally I just see the good things. Except on Facebook, I just see like angry people posting political stuff. On Instagram, I actually see happy people and happy people that want to show their happy lives, but only show their happy lives. I never really see anything on social that's just like, wow, that sucks. Because people don't want others to see the part that sucks. They want to see the part that's enviable and makes them jealous. But what if our social media didn't post the things we want everyone to see? What if if you scrolled through your feed and you only saw the things that you want no one to see? What if the intent of our heart was actually exposed to the world? What if your classmates saw what's actually in your heart? What if your kids or your grandkids saw what was actually in your heart? What if the employer who you want to get a job with actually saw what was actually in your heart? What if your spouse saw what was actually in your heart? The reality is, 
even if no one else sees it, God sees my heart. God sees your heart. He doesn't just see our actions and our, ten, in our, and our choices. He sees the intent. But the good news is when you step into the light, when you admit that you are a sinner and you believe that Jesus died for your sin, you know what God does for you, friend? God gives you a new heart. God gives you a pure heart. God gives you a clean heart. And when he looks upon you, he doesn't look at that corrupt, wicked sinner. Praise the Lord when he looks upon me, even though I know there are ways I need to grow, even though I know I need to be conformed more into the image of Christ. When God looks upon me and when God looks upon you, Christian, he doesn't see the wicked actions of your heart, the wicked intent of your heart. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he looks upon you in love. You don't need to fear the light because Jesus is fit to be our judge. He is also fit to be our savior. Step into the light and there you will find forgiveness and freedom, hope and healing, love and mercy. One final trait about the judgment of Jesus. Jesus judges supremely, Jesus judges justly, and then this, Jesus judges mercifully. Jesus judges mercifully, so offer yourself to him. If you're taking notes in the ones that were given to in the bulletin, this is the last point. There's another point that follows. Sometimes the sermon gets edited after it goes to printing. So just scratch that last point out. This one is the last one of the sermon. Jesus judges mercifully, so offer yourself to him. Do you know what mercy is? Sometimes in the scripture, when it talks about mercy, it, it's referring to compassion, charitability. Other times, it's being talked about in a way that's being contrasted with grace, and that's the way I'm using it now. Grace is receiving what we do not deserve. Mercy is being rescued from what we do deserve. Remember that character Barabbas that we were introduced to at the beginning of the story? Look at chapter 18, verse 38 with me again. Turn your eyes to the scripture, chapter, 38, verse eight, uh, chapter 18, verse 38. After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. In the original language, when this was written by the apostle John, this term robber didn't actually mean, it can be translated robber, but it didn't actually mean a guy who stole stuff. Like when we think about robber today, we think about like a uh, balaclava on and a loaded shotgun and going into a bank and trying to steal something. But if you're like superhero movies, maybe Bat com Batman comes in and saves the day or something. But when this passage is talking about robber. It's not talking about one who steals something. In their context, robber was a general term that ref referred to any type of lawlessness. It'd be similar in the way that we would use the term criminal, right? Just a general term to refer to law-breaking, but there's a lot of different type of criminal activity. So what was it that Barabbas actually was criminally responsible for? Mark chapter five, verse six and seven tells us exactly the crime that Bar Barabbas was in prison for. It says this, now at the feast, he used to release one prisoner whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man named Barabbas. Apparently Barabbas was some like insurgent freedom fighter a guy who participated in or maybe even led an uprising against Roman authority to try and kick them out of their land. But in the process, he killed people and he was in prison. In Pilate's attempts at compromise, he brings forward two people, one who is clearly innocent, Jesus, and one who is clearly guilty, Barabbas. We are all Barabbas. 
as Jesus stood in this guilty man's place so he could be mercifully released. So when Jesus died on the cross, he stood in our place. He suffered the guilt of our sin. Being nailed to the cross wasn't just the wickedness of man. Jesus suffered the wrath of God. When Jesus was led to the cross, he suffered the same shame of our sin. Being mocked by men was not just mere mocking of men, but it was the shame that we have done for our sin. As Jesus stood in his place, so we also stood in our place. The scriptures say that the love and the mercy of God are so great and the perfect picture of God's love and mercy is the cross. The scripture says of God's love that it's as high as the heavens that are above the earth, so great is his love to those who fear him. And to those who believe in him, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our trespasses from us. So friend, if you know like me that you are guilty before God and the judgment of Christ, and you see the depth of God's love for you and the result of forgiveness and freedom that comes from it, what should you do? If you stepped into the light because you know that you're a sinner, but you see his love, what should you do? just as he mercifully offered his life for you in love, offer your life for him. No more walking in the light on Sunday only and walking in the darkness the rest of the week. No more calling him just a good teacher, but submit to him as Lord actually identifying with the Lord Jesus by being baptized, not just saying it with my words, but living it with my life actually loving him and actually living for him. Just like 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verse four says, this is the attitude which we must respond when we see the mercy of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verse four says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one Jesus has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all so that those who live in him would no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and rose again. This is good news because Jesus is fit to be our judge. He alone is fit to be our savior. Would you stand with me as I pray? God, I know I'm a wretched sinner. God, I know that my heart exposed before you is uh, corrupt and crooked and poisoned. I'm in awe again, Lord God, that Jesus who is perfect, that Jesus who is pure, that Jesus who is spotless would willingly decide to suffer for crooked, poisonous sinners like me. This is marvelous. This is wonderful. Thank you for the cross, God. Not an ornate golden piece of jewelry, but a rugged piece, a tor- instrument of torture. And Jesus suffered it. And it was his love Thank you for such a love, Lord God. And thank you that by it, I am judged by the supreme judge, by the just judge, and also the merciful judge. Lord God, let your church see that if they step into the light, they will be forgiven. Let them see that if they step into the light, though they think it's a risk, though it might be fearful, that they will be received by you, just like you received tax collectors, just like you received prostitutes, so you can receive us. Far be it from us that we think we deserve to stand in your light, Lord. All in your light, all of us are wretched. But at the foot of your cross, all of us can be forgiven. Thank you for that fateful day. Thank you for your death and your resurrection. Help us live by it in Jesus' name. Amen.